I know that as soon as I transitioned into a healthy relationship that I personally didn't know how to function. I was so mm -hmm. addicted to the highs and lows that a yeah. static, healthy relationship seemed flat and I didn't know how to embrace it um, because I thought, oh, well, th there's just no, there's no charge in this relationship. Um, there's no energy in this relationship, whether it was a romantic relationship or a friendship, because I had literally been wired to be addicted to the trauma. Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. Hello, friends, and welcome. You know, from the beginning of time, there's been an assault on women's identity and their value. In every culture and time period, women have railed against the mindsets and systems that have sought to hinder and marginalize them. But the struggle against the currents of cognitive bias, prejudice, and discrimination seems to be shifting both culturally and spiritually at this time on the earth. Well, my guest today has insights and experience from all angles of the struggle, the surrender, faith, heartbreak, and healing in the process of becoming in Christ. Tracy, I want to thank you, my friend, for making time in your busy schedule to be with us today. It's an honor to have you. Oh, it's an honor to be with you. Truly, it is so great to see your, your smiling face and to know that we're in the, the same space, at least virtually at the same time. Yes, exactly. And likewise, well, you know, you are one of those people that's so well put together and you're so well spoken. I've heard you speak and you're a powerful speaker, but so many people might look at that and think, um, you know, you've always been that way. I want you to share with us a little of your backstory and some of the things that the enemy tried to bring into your life to shut you down and kind of the journey to where you are today. That, that, is, a, that is a loaded <laughs> question. Um, I am doing everything now that I never ever planned on doing and the things that I never wanted to do. I was wow. least likely, Brenda, to ever walk on a stage or ever hold a microphone. Um, in my first book, I tell a little bit about my story um, and downside up um, how to overcome rejection. Um, I was a byproduct um, of an illegitimate relationship. I never knew who my father was, lived at the babysitters till I was five, and we grew up in abject poverty. And so when I was listening to you read that bio now, it's kind of surreal yeah. <laughs> um, to think that my life, except for the grace and mercy of God, would have ever produced anything productive at all. Um, mm. So I did the majority of things that I do now by accident. <laughs> you know, most yeah. people have a solid five or 10 year plan. <laughs> Mine was probably <laughs> five or 10 year plan to wreck a train. I don't know, it was a train wreck <laughs> waiting to happen. Truly I was. And so I did things thinking, well, if I don't do it, I'm going to be miserable. But if I do do yeah. it, I'm going to be miserable. And so I chose the lesser and by faith stumbled into the, all the things that I'm doing now. And yeah. uh, when people ask me to explain how I got to here, I have no idea. <laughs> wow. That's amazing because, you know, really the journey with Christ is one that is so precious and so organic that oftentimes we, we move through seasons of our lives and we can look back and go, oh my goodness, how did I end up here where I am um, with the blessings that have been bestowed on my life? Listen, from one train wreck to another, I can, I can identify and I certainly understand that. And I think, you know, this is an encouragement to people who are, who feel stuck um, stuck in their limitations and they feel marginalized, but inside Tracy, they dream, they dream that I know I was created for something more. I feel as if I'm called to something bigger. And the truth is, you know, as well as I do that it's so much bigger than us, but there's something that happens when people have experienced deep traumas and, and deep pain, deep betrayals. And that is this kind of narrative that's, it's called the imposter syndrome, where, you know, we kind of, and I think a lot of celebrities have this as well, but, you know, we feel like if people only knew uh, the me that I know, you know, surely they wouldn't love me. But could you speak to that for a moment? And from, a, from, from the place of where Jesus meets us, 
right there. Could you talk to, to people about that? Sure. I would, I would love to, as a matter of fact, talk about imposter syndrome because that's something I've traveled about and spoke over oh, wow. two years now. And I just spoke at the Spark Media Conference and I used the analogy of how my husband and I were, um, of all things, dog sledding up near the Great Divide. And our little team of eight, I asked how far they could pull us. And they said about 150 miles a day. And I noticed there was this little dog um, at the very back of our musher line and uh, she was running sideways. She was pulling at the gang line oh. kind of sideways and I had so much empathy for her. And so when we yeah. stopped and asked the trainer, I said, what is wrong with little Lacey? I said, she's running <laughs> at an angle as she hurt as she wondered what's wrong with her. And he said, oh, no, nothing. He said she's created to be a lead dog. He said that because of her inner experience and because she isn't persuaded that she is created to be a lead dog, he said, we actually have to put her at the back. And he said, we're training her how to lead in every single position until she can gain her confidence and learn to lead, not from the back of the line, but from the front of the line. And I really oh began to think deeply about how little Lacey, everyone saw it in her. Everyone believed it in her. She was hired. She was designed to be this lead dog, but she was put in the very back because of one reason, and that she simply lacked the confidence to move forward. Wow. That gave me chill bumps that didn't go away. <laughs> that was such an amazing analogy. And, and I received that because, you know, God walks us through seasons of training. And oftentimes, you know, we're thinking, well, I, I'm supposed to be there. I'm supposed to be doing that. And I think people get really frustrated in the process of training and being equipped. Training and equipping is so important. And, uh, you know, it's in the, those seasons of training and equipping that we become, our character is built. God puts the fire to the things that don't belong. So I would imagine that as Lacey, this, this lead dog it, uh, is as she's back there in it trained chained to the back of the line she's learning and gaining new perspectives um i think i think we have to stay open minded in those seasons don't you absolutely and it was interesting because she was pulling against the gang line and the trainer said we all laugh at her because she's wow at an angle to make it herself feel like she's being more useful. And he said, we look at her and we laugh at her because she's exerting energy, yeah. unnecessary wow. energy. And she's doing great detriment and harm to her physical mm. anatomy because she's pulling to make herself feel as if she's valuable. Mm. I think mm. so times we overextend ourselves. We work harder than we should. Um, we're, we're manic in our schedules because we're trying to prove our worth. We're trying to find our validation in what we do rather than relaxing into the mm. position we were created to be in. Okay. Let's pause there for a moment because I think we can even take this into our relationships. Um, uh, whether that's a marriage relationship, a parental, a uh, child relationship, or sibling, the struggle often that comes with between people that love each other, wouldn't you say that comes through the mindset of fear of losing control and fear of not being seen or heard or recognized for our leadership qualities for uh, whatever our value is, and, and maybe maybe that's displaced or, or misplaced value that that we have emphasized. Could you could you speak to relationships right now? Absolutely. I know that those. I mean, I'll speak for my for myself. I know that from all the trauma that I went through, um, the up and down, the highs and low of being in relationships where there was addiction on some level, our um, our mental capacities that, that just weren't there for a healthy relationship. I know that as soon as I transitioned into a healthy relationship, that I personally didn't know how to function. I was so. Mm -hmm the highs and lows that a yeah. static, healthy relationship seemed flat. And I didn't know how to embrace it um, because I thought, oh, well, th there's just no, there's no charge in this relationship. Um, there's no energy in this relationship, whether it was a romantic relationship 
or a friendship because I had literally been wired to be addicted to the trauma. And wow. so I was placed in a healthy relationship early in my you know late teens, early 20s. I didn't know how to function in that pattern. And mm. so I had to learn quickly that I was going to lose healthy if mm. I did not learn how to acclimate to what healthy truly looked like. Wow. That's really something uh, to be addicted to the drama and the trauma. Um, you know, does it does it feel a little boring <laughs> and mundane trying to get healthy when when God's saying because, uh, you know, I can relate to something there with the issue um, of me dating and, and, you know, the different types of men that I was attracted to a long time ago when I was really in a much more codependent state of mind. And when God brought Paul into my life, you know, he was so different and it, he wasn't the wine, ya dine, ya smooth talking suave, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I didn't know what to do with myself. It was so disarming and it was very refreshing. Was that a refreshing season for you when you, when God said, you don't have to be addicted to this mess. Yeah, it was life changing. You know, I wrote in Downside Up how to embrace rejection as life's golden opportunity. You mm -hmm. know, I put out in that book and I list the top 10 reasons we're to embrace rejection as a golden mm -hmm. opportunity. And we don't see that. Yeah. And one of the points that I that I made early on in that book is I said, why would we try to drag someone into our future who's not even qualified for our now? And for the life of us, I think we as women, I'm going to repeat that slow. That we, have, <laughs> we have this thing about we are great. I, I ministered this week. We are great reachers, but we mm. are poor releasers. And when we see Eve in the very, you know, Genesis chapter three, the opening um, introduction to women, we see that she was a great reacher. She was reaching for something additional in her environment, but who she was listening to in that mm. process is what yeah. destroyed her. But we're poor releasers. We're great yeah. at reaching for things, for people, relationships, for opportunities, but we're very poor at releasing. And wow. so sometimes we'll have to release people and opportunities and situations to take big giant divine bolt cutters and yeah. he'll cut us free from things that we should not drag into our future. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. That's rich. And your books are all great. I have another one of your books here, Becoming Brave. And uh, there's there's just so much richness in this book. But you, you talk about betrayal in relationships in this book, and you refer to how the seeds of that betrayal can often manifest in our own self-betrayal. Can you, can, you, um, can you describe what that is? Yeah, I mean, it's so easy. We, we often look at each other like, well, how in the world could you uh, betray yeah. me? You know, whether mm -hmm. it's a or marriage or relationship or whatever. And mm -hmm. we pay a close attention of how we betray ourselves. We lay aside our goals or our ambitions or our things that we want. And we, we find, and I do unpack that in great length. That's not easy, just a, a short synopsis of yeah. that, not easy. Um, but we it, it, we do unpack how we are prone. We are, again, hot wired for self-betrayal. And I think women, um, just because we're reachers, again, we reach um, broken, we reach for the wounded, we reach um, for the wayward child. It's not the father out at 3 a.m. that's running the streets, it's the mother looking for that wayward child. And so we're, we're wired to be pursuers. And so often we pursue everything but the healthy version of ourselves. And in doing so, we self-sabotage and we end up betraying ourselves. Yeah, that's so good. And you also talk about how you were inspired by Wonder Woman and how that women can be both fierce and uh, feminine, feminine and fierce at the same time. I think this is all, a, we're such complex beings. And so as when we're talking about these layers of rejection and betrayal and how we respond to them, um, you know, most women in our culture have 
have come to the conclusion that they're finding power in anger um, and their rage. But but actually, that's not where we find power. We're, we're still kind of enslaved to that wound when that's the the extent of our um, our strength. So can you tell us what that means to be feminine and fierce at the same time? Yeah, I, I actually love those words. And um, to add to that, I, I tell women all the time, I said, you can be brave without being brash. And yeah. uh, I guess brave without being brash. Mm-hmm. And I know that for decades that we fought for our slice of the pie. And now there are more women CEOs than men. And now we went from fighting over the slice of pie to fighting who owns the pie company. And so women went from being at war with men and being at war with culture to now women are at war with each other. And that mm. is God did not create yeah. us. He created us to be brave. The original word for helper in Genesis 3 is the word ezer, E-Z-E-R, which means to be brave and courageous, fierce, and a warrior, a savior, and a rescuer. And the first time that God ever defined woman was with those adjectives. And the Mm -hmm. only time that God ever used that word again was the 14 times that he self-described himself. And I think that is so powerful that the root word, the Hebrew combination of two root words of how God labeled us included being fierce, rescuer, savior, brave. And so he took the parts of himself and the best part of mankind. And he welded those Mm -hmm. things together for us to be this fabulously fierce warrior. And again, my challenge to women is you can be all of those things without rude and haughty and arrogant Mm -hmm. and boisterous. And you can do, you can have this presence about you that is both Mm -hmm. calming and alarming at the same time. It sure is. It sure is. And oftentimes what we're, uh, what we envy in someone else is really just the image of God in them. And, you know, it begs the question that we each have to ask ourselves, if, if we're Christ followers, especially, you know, why should I be envious of God's mark on somebody else? I mean, that just puts it into perspective there. These are the, the attributes of God. And so, you know, I think we try, though, like you were saying, to um, to conjure up that strength and that that sense of power. So then we're projecting lies and it's not authentic. And really, the only thing that can deliver us is the truth. And that's what sets us free. And humility is such a key thing to be able to say, you know what, I'm just going to be me and I'm going to let him complete me. There is a, a, another quote in your book here, Becoming Brave, which is beautiful. How different would the journey be if we chose to defend and protect one another rather than expose one another's vulnerabilities? That really says something there, Tracy. Um Women have, like you said, been pitted against one another. But I really see um, something happening in this season on the earth as women's voices are being released and there's more honor coming. And and God is almost uncovering this Pandora's box and all the wrongs are being made right. Systems have been, our, our systems are falling that have been marginal, marginalizing women, excuse me, and uh, trying to hold them back, which is all really fear-based. But what's happening is women are starting to identify with one another in our vulnerabilities. Can you speak to the importance of why we need to be doing that, especially as Christ followers, and how can we be a hope to, uh, to the world and a light to the world in this area of healing? Yeah, and you know that is a difficult question. Um, and, and, and cultural engagement is to find women mm-hmm. who are comfortable with each other. I think because we have been pitted against each other, finding um, enriching conversations, safe place. Um, I think social media has created an alarming uh, place for what I call false fame, and it mm-hmm. truly is false fame. And so we find ourselves competing um, one with another against. Uh, each other's false fame, if you will. Yeah. Um, the more time that we spend together, the more time that we spend praying for each other. Mm-hmm. I like one day, every single day, 
I have a list of women that I pray for one a day, highlight her needs, her goals, her desires, reach out wow. to them, fuse um, conversations around them, spend yeah. time together, removed and, and apart, and um, really hearing what women have to say. You know, we have glorified our traumas, but we really don't have anything to say about our own courage. Um, a few years ago, I was asked to go and speak in a remote village to women in a faraway cabin, and I pitched them a question. They were each given five minutes to talk about their trauma. The war room really roared as they swapped stories like, sister, <laughs> I asked yeah. another question about how relationships ended poorly. The same response. And then I gave them five minutes to talk to each other about times that they had lived in a courageous and authentic way. And all of a sudden, the room grew deathly silent. Wow. I could hear the hum of the outdated appliance across the room. I could hear the clock ticking in the background. And it occurred to me that when it came to courage, that women had absolutely nothing to say to each other. And I mm. thought, how pitiful that men, you put them around a campfire and yeah. their stories grow bigger <laughs> and more story. <laughs> yes, but women don't know how to talk to each other specifically. Oh about being courageous. We can talk to each other about our dysfunction, our trauma, our grief, the things that didn't happen, the things that should have happened, but we don't really know how to talk to each other in a way that says, you know what? Here's what God did through me. Here's how God used me. Here's a story of courage. Here's an act of bravery. And, and until we can become comfortable talking to each other about that, how do we train the next generation? You know, Disney... Yeah stellar job about teaching the girl how not to be the princess that waits on a prince, but how to drag yeah. out her own sword. And I'm thinking we as believers, those who walk with Christ have to do a much better job about mm -hmm. training each other how to talk about things about courage and bravery with each other. Do you think that is because we have believed the lies that, I mean, since the days of, of the Garden of Eden, I mean, we've. do you think that women have believed the lies that have been placed on them as part of that curse that came out of the Garden? Uh, but that's also what Jesus came to redeem. Do you think that's part of the narrative that we're breaking now? Absolutely. I mean, for generations, the last portrait we had of Eve was she was standing in the garden naked, shame having shattered the commandments of God. But just two verses later, God goes in and he says, hold up, let me stop the script. He said, this is the woman for generations, the savior of humanity mm. is going to come from her DNA. And so- wow. Stop the script with this naked woman hanging around in sheets of shame. But yeah. man stops her story there. Culture stops her story there. God did not stop her story there. He said, if you look into the annals of time, he said, it is through that woman's legacy that she is going to literally destroy the vice grip of her enemy. She's literally going to crush his head. And through her DNA, the savior of humanity is going to be born. Amazing. That's that's such insight. And I would love for you to address the issue of women preaching and some of the scriptures that have been misinterpreted about women being quiet in the church. I, I'd love for you to address that right now. That would take about a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> really well, let's see. Um, yeah, I know we just have a few minutes here, but um, there's a yes. systematic um, concealment of women. And throughout scriptures, um, wherever you see powerhouse women that were used by God, whether that was Hannah, Elizabeth, the mother of Moses, every prophetic child that was ever born in the earth came mm. from a woman whose womb had been shut down for a season. Yeah. Not because God had judged her, but because through her would become prophets, priests, kings, and warriors. And so just doing as a, a, a script scriptorial overview of women who were used by God in paramount ways and amazing ways. If you would just look at their history, you would see that average did not come from them, but prophets, priests, kings, and warriors were come from them. Yeah. And nowhere in scripture does it say women were not given power are the authority to mm. preach or share the word of God. Absolutely not. Yeah. And thank you, Lord. You didn't just shut our mouths and tell us to sit down, be pretty, go yes. make dinner, you know, and, and do the laundry. Do we can do all those things <laughs> and share can. the gospel as well. <laughs>
<laughs> we can. We can do all those things, and we can be smart, intelligent, and courageous people. And you know what? That's what I love about you, Tracy, is that you are that woman who you've you've got the backs of other women. You you are the you're the champion that has been there and you are an encourager and God's anointing is on you, my friend. And uh, I think that women right now are especially challenged to be able to hear the truth and not take the counterfeit version of what it means to be brave. And you are brave, my friend. And I want to thank you. I wish we had all day. We'll have to do this again because you're a wellspring and you have so many wonderful analogies. Um, I'll invite you back to uh, come and talk with us again. Okay. It's an honor to share with you, friend. Thank you so much for hosting me today. Awesome. Well, I love you. you. And my friends, I thank you for being here. You have just seen some amazing information that really speaks into who you are and who you were created to be as a woman. And also for men, we were created to work together. And I hope that you have been encouraged today. You are valuable. And I hope that today you've decided that you will be brave and courageous. Thank you for joining us, and I invite you again to come next time. I'm Brenda Crouch.